Greetings, everyone. Welcome back to the Pitt UN Summit Live Studio. I'm your co-host, Kip Dooley. And I'm Renee Cummings. And uh, in this segment, we're going to be talking all about public interest technology and public service. Um, the, the need has really never been greater for technologists who want to work in the public service, whether that's in government, in healthcare, in law, in public safety, in, in benefits like, like public housing. Um, and so we're really delighted to have here today um, two exceptional leaders from the uh, Pitt and Public Service space. Um, we have Octavia Abel and Danica Harudian. Um, so I'm going to start with, with Octavia. You um, started this uh, incredible organization called Govern for America. Can you tell us just a little bit about, about what the organization does and, and why you started it? Um, and uh, yeah, just the, the work that you do there. Yeah, thank you, Kip and Renee, for having me here today. Wonderful to meet you. It's wonderful to meet you too. Um, so, Govern for America's mission is to build the next generation of public servants to mm. create a more responsive government that better reflects and serves our communities. And when I think about the role of public interest technology and how that intersects with our work, it's really about that piece of responsiveness. We know that the way that people experience actions of government really plays out with how our policy and legislation gets implemented on the ground. And so much of that work today actually comes through technology or is informed by technology. And so the work that Govern for America does is to activate a network of early career public servants. We run a fellowship program where we connect recent graduates into high impact jobs at the state and local level and then support them with two years of training so that they really become effective at getting things done in that environment environment and go on to spark a longer term commitment to public service. We've had alumni go on to be the director of emerging technology for the state of, or the Commonwealth, excuse me, of Pennsylvania. Um, we have uh, an alum who is the deputy chief of staff for the US Department of Energy. And what we really see is putting folks on that pathway and providing the exposure in to public service work and public interest technology can really be a launching pad for their entire careers and bringing that lens of understanding the how to bring their own expertise from a subject matter perspective, but also their lived expertise in engaging with these systems can really be transformational for the results that they can deliver for residents. Uh, as someone who's worked in the criminal justice system, uh, we've done so many studies that look at trust between mm -hmm. our citizens and, of course, the justice system. I know a critical aspect of your work is also around trust and building that trust between mm -hmm. citizens and government. I know there was a very interesting statistic recently, 15% uh, mm -hmm. of, of people actually trust what the government is doing. Given where we are, given that we just had an election, and given that public interest technology uh, is still uh, relatively new, how do you foresee the kind of work that you have to do around trust? Mm. Renee, I think it's a huge challenge that we have in this moment, and we really should take to heart the fact that a lack of trust in our institutions has ramifications for every aspect of our society. Um, you know, I think about it in, in two main ways. One, the interactions that people have with public servants and with systems has a direct correlation to the experience they have with government writ large. And so if we make those interactions and that service delivery better and people feel like they are heard, their needs are met, that's going to go a long way into changing um, those statistics. And that's our belief at GFA. I think another you know, aspect of the work that we really need to recognize and wrestle with is there are communities who historically have been harmed by the choices that we have made through government um, and been left behind by policy. And so part of that work is to actually not only engage directly with those communities and repair harm where it's been caused, but to elevate the voices and perspectives of leaders who have that background and understanding and can really be credible messengers and engage critically in the work to make sure that we're not leaving any one behind, and we are building a government that works for all Americans. But let's also introduce quickly the concept of AI into mm. that trust dynamic. So now we have the relationship that you're trying to build to make it stronger. Now you have technology, uh, disinformation, deep fakes. These are all critical aspects of the trust conversation. How do you engage uh, 
you know, public servants to make them more trusting of this technology, and of course citizens to let them know that this technology can really be uh, the, the, you know, the deal breaker when it comes to the kinds of service delivery excellence that you're trying to deliver. Mm -hmm. I think it goes back to both having the right policy and regulatory environments in place so that we can understand how we're using people's data and we can be really clear um, and communicate and provide that those examples to the public of what it looks like to build, to share, and, and really build up that trust that we're making choices that will keep them safe and protect them. I think it also goes to providing, hiring talent who can engage in these AI enabling roles and really think about how to leverage AI in ways that are helpful to people and not harmful, um, and providing upskilling and supportive resources through collaborations with um, you know, academic partners, other organizations in the public interest tech ecosystem to really make sure that they have the competencies, skills, and, and way of understanding and thinking about both the opportunities and the challenges with this work. Um, and look, I think it's I think it's one of the largest um, you know pieces of disruption and transformation that we will see in government in the next few years. And it's the technology is moving rapidly, which means that we in public servants. Uh, service need to also move rapidly to be thoughtful, mindful, but respond um, at the speed of change. That's great. I want to come to, to Danica and, and ask you a little bit about your work with uh, Partnership for Public Service. So you, you um, do work that's similar to what Octavia is doing with, uh, with Govern for America, but in a slightly different way and uh, with different kinds of government bodies. So tell us a bit about Partnership for Public Service and, and what you all are doing. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. And our work certainly is so complimentary. Um, the Partnership for Public Service is a nonprofit that works with the mission to um, build a better government and a stronger democracy on the federal level. We do a variety of work across the federal level. And I'm a senior manager on our federal workforce programs team. So we similarly work with early career talent programming. Um, and the statistic is that there's only 7% um, only 7% of the federal workforce is under the age of 30. Um, so we are um, working across academia and um, federal agencies to bridge some of these um, challenges of hiring the next generation of public servants into these meaningful, impactful roles across the country. And, and these are you know, civilian, non-political um, uh, work across the country. And um, since 2022, we've run a internship program um, placing students in paid internships in, in federal agencies. And um, we're in our sixth cycle now. And, and as of fall 2023, we started a specific program track in public interest technology, then added data science alongside others you would think in government, like public administration, government contracting. Um, so I'm excited about this growing internship track and, and currently growing this wonderful cohort of students who are engaging with each other um, young government leaders and and hopefully having that entry into government service. And so what are some of the, the job titles or job descriptions? Like what, what, when people come through your fellowship and they get placed in a federal agency, what, what, are, what does the work look like or what are some ways that the, that the work uh, takes place? Absolutely. We have students in all areas, but I'll share a few public interest tech examples. Um, we've had around 30 interns with the National Science Foundation in the Directorate of Technology, Innovation, and Partnership. So um, it's, you know, students' interdisciplinary interest in PIT, including um, Office of Translational Impacts, Research and Development, Grant Making, um, and, and then working with large data sets that have a great um, impact on you know using technology for the social good whether that's the department of transportation and rail safety um, public safety and the department of housing and urban development working on home ownership and and um, and bridging different access to different groups across across the country and in field offices around the country so i'm inspired by those students and and their projects each cohort you know one of the challenges has been really attracting people into these jobs, particularly at the uh, federal level. And there's been a lot of conversation that maybe we need to be a little more creative with the job titles and the job descriptions to really bring those interdisciplinary minds into the space. Uh, how are you feeling about that? And are you doing any work 
in that space to really attract, because so many people just believe it's technical, or it's coding, it's computer science, or it's just not for me. And what we want to do from the PIT uh, experience is really bring those interdisciplinary and intersections into uh, the federal space. And how has that been for you, uh, trying to attract and energize uh, people to come into this career field? Absolutely. Um, I'm gonna ask, you can actually bring the mic just down a little bit. Thank right there, you. it's perfect, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. A lot of the work that we do also is just about advising and supporting students. When you see a job posting, what does it mean? Um, and our, our website's really easy to remember. It's called gogovernment.org because um, we are encouraging students to explore these resources that can help them along the way. We have um, career guides for data science, for computer science, for public administration, and it'll tell you how to translate a job title to the what is the job description or what to search for on USA Jobs. We're really just aiming to bridge that gap and provide resources um, to academia and students and job seekers. While also um, on the other side working with HR managers and um, and, and, and HR leaders in the federal space to share what we're hearing from students, what we're hearing from job seekers, and, and how to support them. And what are you hearing? Uh, maybe you could share some of that with us. What are students saying? Sure, yes. I've been traveling across universities this fall on our third annual public service roadshow. We've reached over 2,000 students this fall. Um, I see great appetite for public service across the board. Um, whether that's in Montana and interest in the Forest Service, or you know here in California, um, interest in in federal jobs that are also based in California. Over 85% of federal jobs are outside of the D.C. area. So those are some things I like to make sure students know about. That's great. So we're we're here at the Pitt UN Summit at San Jose State University. Um, so much of the work that you do is you know across the country with with students, with partners in government in, in different parts of the U.S. Um, and now so many of your, your colleagues and friends and connections are here in person. So I'm really curious to hear from you both what, um, what conversations uh, have excited you, if there's any particular themes or threads that you're um, looking forward to bringing back into your work when, uh, when we get home on, on Monday, uh, or maybe you have a, a day off for the federal holiday, but, uh, <laughs> but on Tuesday, 9 a.m., we're opening our, our emails again and getting back on meetings. So what are you, what are you excited to, to carry forward? Absolutely. I've so appreciated hearing from PIT experts and on the academia side about PIT competencies because our program, the Future Leaders in Public Service Internship Program, runs professional development. We want to make a meaningful experience for them alongside their federal internships. And so really thinking about creating and curating a great learning experience for them to um, match what what they're learning in terms of competencies um, in the pit space that will help them in their next steps post-internship and, and just really create a great professional development experience for them. I would say the energy of the students that are here um, is something that gives me a lot of hope for the future. It's, um, it's just been really incredibly energizing and I would be remiss to not say that the GFA fellowship application is open for anyone who is looking for a full-time paid job in government and two years of professional development and community. Um, you can go to www.govforamerica.org um, and find the application. Um, I think the other thing that's been really energizing is seeing how the interdisciplinary nature and all of the connections that are building across government and academia um, and industry are really allowing for faster collaborations to solving big problems. And I think that collective effort um, to make progress on some of the things that are we care about most and are impacting our communities is really a takeaway I have for all of the opportunities um, that exist in this space, but also the tremendous amount of work that's happening across the ecosystem. That's wonderful. Well, Octavia and Danica, thank you so much for joining us. I just want to make sure I have the URLs right, because they're some of the best URLs I've ever heard, but it's govforamerica.org. Yes. And gogovernment.org. .org. Wow, okay, so folks. <laughs> thank you so very make much. Make sure to check out their work, and thanks for coming and joining the rest the of the summit. Keep doing the work that you're doing. We need you in this space. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Um, so, uh, Renee, I'm really curious. Um, you know, you have actually worked in public service roles before, mostly in the criminal justice system. Um, I, I'm curious what you're seeing in terms of how that landscape has changed now that we have such a greater understanding of the role of technology 
in our public services. What have you seen change over the years, and, and what are you excited about for this next generation of technologists in well, government? Well, definitely, uh, I'm not trying to date myself here, but, <laughs> <laughs> but we thought about tech and public service. You know, that was in a, a room somewhere, sure. uh, some sort of dusty a room. A wall of right? computers, yeah. Yeah, uh -huh. something that we didn't interact with. Sure. Now we're interacting with it. Now data and uh, technology are part of everything that we do. So what we're realizing now is if you're working in uh, public service uh, or if you're working in public interest technology, you need to have a very sophisticated understanding of data. You need to understand AI. Now you're trying to understand how do we procure this technology? How do we ensure we're procuring this technology in an ethical way? We also need to think about responsible AI, responsible tech tech for good, uh, trying to do things that are resilient and sustainable, thinking about the environment. So, so much has changed and so much is changing quickly. Most governments are yet to truly upskill their public sector, their public servants, when it comes to understanding technology. Many legislators are still not there yet. Many countries still struggling with how to design a national AI strategy, how to govern this technology, how to govern data. Uh, when we were thinking about AI, then we got Gen AI, and we're thinking about that as well. So there's a lot more thinking, a lot more work uh, for the public sector to get ahead of. Uh, the challenge is, is how do we upskill uh, this large labor force in real time, and how do we govern what we are doing in real time? So many challenges, that is why civic tech and of course public interest technology now so critical to the space uh, for us to deliver the kinds of services that citizens deserve and of course desire. And it's all about excellence and efficiency and just getting this work done in, in, in really effective ways, but doing it in ways that are responsible, ways that are trustworthy, and of course ensuring we have uh, you know, the kinds of teams, interdisciplinary teams, because we know it's, 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 it's social, and we've always got to think about long-term impacts. Absolutely, and I, and I loved hearing from, from Danica and from Octavia about how they're really trying to reframe what working in government looks like and how young people see those roles. Um, because I think we can oftentimes see government roles as being sort of slow or very bureaucratic, and of course there are those challenges. Or back in the days when we had the pen, you know, the uh, pens in our pockets right, kind right, of right. thing. <laughs> exactly. But there really are so many exciting things that you can A do. A lot of exciting things. And, and, and career paths you can find that really are, that are deeply fulfilling. Um, because government can be such a powerful tool for, uh, for advancing any issue you care about, whether that's housing, healthcare, climate, et cetera. And that's why it's so important when it comes to the job descriptions and mm -hmm. the job postings, because so many of it are still very traditional and are not really matching those interdisciplinary skills that we need. Let's say responsible AI, let's say trust and safety, let's say uh, individuals who are really uh, going into government to do the intersectional uh, kinds of assignments that are so required. So uh, many uh, students and even uh, uh, you know uh, professionals, sometimes they see these uh, postings and they're thinking, this is uh, really for someone who's heavy into computer science, or, or this is for someone who's a coder. But we need more than that in the public sector to the, do the work that we need to get done. Absolutely. Well, we're really excited for our next segment, which is going to be talking about public interest technology and law. So we're shifting from, from government to law. Uh, we're going to be hearing from, from three lawyers and legal experts about the, uh, the way that they're developing career paths and, and curriculum and pursuing research to, uh, to, to bring more law lawyers into uh, technology spaces and also to bring more uh, technologists uh, into law. So we're going to welcome up onto the set. We have three people, so it's going to get a little tight. But we'll now we be, do the dance. We're all friends. We're all friends now after a few days being together in person. So we do the pit dance. That's right. Uh, <laughs> what is the pit dance? The, yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll we'll figure it out as we go. Yeah. Um, so I want to I want to welcome to to the Pit UN Summit Live Studio. We have uh, Laura Maddox Bingham from Temple University. Um, we have Miguel Willis uh, from UPenn, and we have Eduardo Gonzalez from the American Academy of Sciences, of Arts and Sciences. Can't forget the arts yeah, part. Very important. That's right. <laughs> um, so I'm going to start um, my question, uh, my questions uh, with Laura here. Um, Laura, you've had a long career as a public interest lawyer in a number of different settings. We were having a great conversation last night about how um, 
you know, you didn't set out to necessarily be working in something related to technology, but over the years it's become more and more part of your work um, as a lawyer and as a, a legal scholar and as a, uh, um, an educator. Mm -hmm. So um, tell us a bit about how that has, how you've come into this work and what it is that you're doing now at Temple. Sure. Um, is this working? Yeah. Yes, you can actually <laughs> hold it a little bit down, kind down of like here? near your chest. Okay. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> Um, yes. All right. Well, yeah, I mean, maybe just to elaborate a little bit, uh, when I was in law school, I, I have no technological background, and I actually found it very alienating, uh, even thinking about learning about how law and technology intersected. Uh, the classes were, uh, the people who, were, who seemed like they were going to excel in that environment had a chem background <laughs> or, you know, an engineering background. And I had a human rights background and humanities. Uh, so I stayed out of it. I kind of veered into, as you say, you know, I was working uh, largely as an anti-discrimination lawyer. Uh, I was working largely trans in, in other contexts outside of the United States doing international human rights cases at the intersection of migration and discrimination, right? Um, lo and behold, and I think a lot of us have the same story, technology came in. <laughs> um, and the systems that I was working in, large bureaucracies for access to uh, personal identification documents, for instance, how you prove you're a citizen. Uh, these are vital documents in any country, um, but in a lot of systems, you cannot get a job, you cannot uh, get access to health care, your kids can't go to school if you don't have a national ID card that, that proves that you're a citizen. All of a sudden, these bureaucracies became digitized. There were large digital transformation um, projects going on and no guardrails, and, and the, the kind of discriminatory structures weren't being fixed that we had been arguing about for, you know, decades. Um, so. I bring both of those uh, sets of experiences into how I think about how we're teaching lawyers today at Temple University. Um, we create a very belonging atmosphere for people from all different kinds of backgrounds to engage with tech accountability. Um, you know, what happened, how do you prevent harm? How do you take a preventative approach? What does regulation have to say about making sure that tech products are safe, et cetera? How, but also these questions about, you know, technology can actually make things a lot better and lawyers need to understand that and need to understand how that impacts their own profession. Um, and, uh, you know, I know the, the previous panel was government, right? How is it changing government? How can it change government for the better? That's great. We're just going to go down the line here. We'll pass pass the mic down. So Miguel, I'd love to hear. First of all, love the Basquiat shirt. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Excellent. You thank can you. hold the mic right right, right around here? right yes, around the cool. crown of the, okay, of the T Rex right here, there. That's right perfect. Here. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> um, so Miguel, tell us a, a little bit about about how you came into the space and what yeah. exactly you're you're doing at uh, at UPenn. I believe you're an innovator in residence. Yes. Right? This may be the coolest job title, title I've <laughs> ever heard of. Yeah. Yeah. So I I think I got into this work. Uh, my one old year at law school, uh, attending a legal hackathon, uh, I think everyone there wanted to kind of create the next Uber for law mm. type of model. And I thought that let's let me steal this model and do it for social justice. Mm. I, I went into law school to pers pursue a career in public interest and social justice. So uh, that that kind of created the inception of the social justice hackathon. Uh, which got together lawyers, technologists, um, you know, community activists, legal aid attorneys to build tools in response to uh, this kind of justice crisis that we have in America where 80 million people are going into courts every year alone. Uh, um, whether that's for, you know, eviction cases or uh, consumer debt cases uh, to kind of help build tools that, that would help lawyers, that would democratize the law. Um, and so from, from that inception, I think we kind of spread that. Uh, and I, I had an opportunity to go around kind of law schools across the country uh, and really see how technology was being taught within curriculum. So that kind of led to the inception and founding of the Access to Justice Tech Fellows Program, which is a, a fellowship model that uh, aims to um, engage and empower the next generation of uh, lawyers, uh, and specifically focusing on how can we kind of create equitable leadership within this space. As we know, 
the law profession, the technology field are two of the most least diverse professions. So how can we build out equitable leaders that can understand both technology and the law uh, and, and really leverage those uh, two tools uh, to, to build a better kind of society? And so uh, since the inception of that program, we've had over 101 fellows uh, you know, work on projects uh, across 32 states, whether you're creating um, a kind of turbo tax to respond to an eviction or uh, with uh, working with the ACLU to examine whether VTC technologies afford litigants due process rights. Uh, so, you know, I absolutely love that I, I get to work across issue areas, across communities. I get to collaborate with cool people like Laura and Eduardo. Um, and you know, I'm trying to build that within my practice, praxis within my teaching, right? At the at the law school, like, you know, focusing on technology, uh, social justice, uh, you know, in trying to inspire people to, because the the work is is exhilarating. We get to solve problems and challenges that uh, you know aren't easy, right? We get to work uh, with communities. Uh, we get to, we are a serving profession, but I think just marriage with technology provides us an opportunity to really uh, address some of these kind of crises. So I'll stop. That's great. That's great. I know Renee is going to have a lot of follow-up questions, but I'm going to ask yeah. Eduardo a little yeah. bit. So you're at the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and, and I know that you're, you're really passionate about um, ecosystem building and building networks. So tell us a bit about your work and how you're helping to connect people from different institutions and different parts of the legal world. Sure. Um, so very glad to, to have been invited to um, this convening, especially because when I go to civil justice conferences, um, usually it's the same crowd. People know each other. They're empowering each other. Um, same community, different people. And I love that the, the focus is on imagining how technology can serve the public. Um, and, and that's the sort of kind of connections and, and field building that I've been doing um, with my time at the American Academy. Our project uh, is implementing recommendations that we publish that talk about increasing uh, funding and resources for legal services, getting lawyers to care more and do services that um, actually impact low-income communities, using other professions like social workers or medical professionals to help get the assistance that people need when the problems arise. Um, and just greater collaboration, that's one of the key recommendations that we have. And the reason why is because every state is gonna have their own court system, their own rules, their own community of lawyers, judges, and experts that are gonna be navigating and operating that system. Uh, and unless you are comparing your baseline to the impact and the potential and ideas elsewhere, you're not gonna understand the opportunity gaps that you're missing. Um, so the work that we've done, uh, we kind of interview, uh, we do stakeholder convenings, and we bring people together to talk about the hard questions so that we can reach consensus about good and better practices and then understand what the inappropriate use and exploitation of the law might be so that we can protect citizens in their pursuit of using the legal system that's supposed to be designed for them. Um, and for me, the, the technology piece is not always about the really shiny gen AI or large language models um, because you pick any county that's not a city in the US and their website needs a lot of help. Mm. They do not have button hierarchy. People cannot use a search feature to understand and look up the information that's already free and available to them. So simply having technology skills and capacity in the legal system is going to make the system better at baseline, better able to adopt and implement future tech. Um, so this community of skills and people that are imagining better uses for technology, trust me, a legal aid organization, a court somewhere out there really wants you to kind of contribute and help them understand how to implement tech. Uh, definitely. I'm going to play devil's advocate or agent provocateur, <laughs> either one. We're with lawyers. Uh, okay. I think they're up for so, it. Yeah, yeah. We're ready. We always hear, two things we always hear, one, law and innovation. Could that even be a thing? You know, do we, how do we innovate uh, the law? The other thing we hear in the realm of AI governance and data governance is that the law is always lagging behind the technology. In the work that you're doing, speak about what you're doing to bring the law and the technology side to side apace uh, as we uh, you know, go into this uh, tech race and talk about the fact that many people believe that innovation and law 
are two things that uh, cannot come together. Somehow the law is archaic and innovation is forward thinking. I can, I can go at this one first. Um, and, and first, I think it's the, the shifting the narrative uh, when we talk about the law. We are not out there discovering and seeing the law as it is. It is created by human interactions, human services. They're operated by human judges and lawyers that move through them. The problems people have are also human problems. So the law is going to constantly be changing. And it's not the innovation that, that maybe we want. Um, but people are going to access that system, how they're going to. It used to be you have to go and read a book, but then we had Ask Jeeves, we now have Google. People are going to look for information because they have a problem. How are we going to adjust the technology, improve the information so that when somebody is interacting with the law, they have the information they need and the skills they need to achieve it. When I think about the law that way, I think it's constantly innovating. And sure, there's a lot of interventions that we can put in there, but I think that design approach and thinking about how we can improve the law means it's innovating, but maybe we want it to be doing something different. Um, and the way that we bring, I think, the tech into the law uh, is understanding that we are all authors of content. We are authors of ideas and articulation. And that is what the technology helps us do, is, is better communicate, better message, and sift through information. And, and I think that's how I see the potential in this intersection and have hope that the law is changing. Yeah, and uh, th thank you for that question. Uh, because, you know, all the time I, I look at innovation as kind of, you don't always need technology to innovate. So when we're talking about some of these kind of systemic challenges, right, uh, I think it is innovation to change the color of law, right, to build up equitable leadership. Now, we can leverage these technologies and tools uh, to help us kind of amplify that, but we also need to be cognizant of the ways that technology does big corporations kind of threaten our rights and dignities, and in what ways can we uh, utilize uh, mechanisms of governance and accountability um, and laws to kind of correct those kind of injustices. Um, and, you know, I think other innovations, there are tools that are being developed and made that offer, really democratize the law, provide the law for free or at a, a low cost. Uh, uh, you look at these kind of, uh, what do you call it, legal zooms. Uh, there's another one. Um, you know, there's a, a various amount of companies that are saying, hey, this lawyer thing, for too long, you know, people had to pay for a lawyer per hour, a couple hundred dollars, completely unaffordable uh, for the most segments of society. Most segments of lawyers can't afford a billable hourly rates uh, for attorneys. So how can we uh, break down this legal matter to provide uh, people with transparency around pricing and costs. And so you're seeing some innovations with the legal regulatory space to allow for new technologies to come in. Um, and then uh, talking about like, how can we really build transdisciplinary, cross-disciplinary, interdisciplinary communities of folks uh, to solve some of these challenges. So there are pockets of, I think, innovation throughout both academia, this is an innovation, right? Yeah. Yeah. We, you brought, uh, uh, you know, Pitt UN has brought uh, I'm brother of game changers from all types of sectors together under one roof to kind of critically solve these uh, challenges using this kind of public um, interest technology framework. And I think it's in its infancy now, but just hearing about some of the things like the global expansion, and it's really exciting. And I'm again, I'm. I'm you know, our, our, we were saying how messy, or I was saying how messy <laughs> our collaboration sometimes is, mm. but I, it's, it's, it's fun to work together um, over the years or across projects. So I, I do think that collaboration um, and, and trying to address these things together and collectively is another form of innovation because when you bring in those different ideas, uh, uh, I may look at a problem differently than Eduardo or Laura. And so having, what does that look like when we bring communities within that? What does that look like when we bring young people? Uh, what does it look like when we bring attorneys who may have retired back into the fold to help um, create digital literacy for communities uh, pro bono? So. Yeah. <laughs> um, what is there left to say? No, I. What I. Uh, what my mind went right to uh, is the accountability piece. You know, I just to me, 
uh, I believe that you can't have public interest technology without lawyers in the room. I'm sorry. Maybe nobody wants to hear that. But, you know, I mean, I, I think you have, to, you have to have accountability that has teeth. And um, that's where, actually, uh, you know, I think innovation is a, is a word that a lot of mischief can get sandwiched mm -hmm. under. Yeah. It is a very flexible word. You know, we could probably talk until the end of this program about <laughs> innovation. <laughs> Um, and, you know, some, something that creative use of the law can do when uh, the layout of technology, even claiming the mantle of public interest technology, is actually doing harm, uh, is to slow down innovation. And nobody likes to hear that. Uh, but, but sometimes it's important. You know, sometimes it's it. really <laughs> necessary. And uh, that's why we have legal structures and, and legal systems. And that doesn't mean that innovation stops. Um, you know, but I, I think that these are levers of power and just picking up on uh, some of the, the points that Miguel has been emphasizing about who holds those levers and who gets to decide when it's time to pull the brakes, who's gathering the evidence, who's paying attention to, uh, you know, ev eviction rates and how many people don't have lawyers to address their, their legal problems. Um, so that's where I, I think uh, you know, the, the innovative piece comes in for me and how also the law kind of intersects with our innovation economy. Um, and, um, yeah, I mean, the last piece is uh, maybe to pick up on, Eduardo, your point about we're not really talking about uh, the cutting edge, right? Large language models, generative AI, uh, in terms of how the legal system could leverage technology to improve the lives of, especially people who are who have been left out of um, of protection. Uh, I think the same goes for creative use of the law. Actually, in this space, yeah, definitely. you know, there are some really boring topics that need to get taught: freedom definitely. of information law, yeah. procurement. Most you know, definitely. like notice, the really sexy yeah, stuff. Yeah, like yeah. rulemaking, rulemaking, about, administrative rulemaking. Yes. You know. These are uh, they're just fun. To, they are great tools. I love using them, um, and uh, and also understanding that if you're a litigator and you're using the law as that as that power lever, winning is not necessarily making it to a judgment, and that's when you you declare victory. Right? Mm -hmm. There are lots of really important steps in a process of using law. For a, so, for a social justice end in, you know, in this space of public interest technology. When technology is, is it's entering every aspect of everyday life. Um, and it's not really about uh, being the savior lawyer and marching to court and filing your case. You know, it's like, how, how, does, how is that a community-based effort? Mm -hmm. uh, so I think there's a lot to draw on from public interest lawyering and bring into this conversation mm -hmm. because public interest lawyering shifted into movement-based lawyering and that's where the really exciting work is and i would just before we wrap up anyone at home watching who's considering going to law school or becoming a lawyer check out temple university law school institute for innovation law Eyelet. Eyelet. Law, innovation, and technology. And technology. <laughs> check out UPenn. Check out Miguel's work as, as the innovator in residence. Mm -hmm. And check out some of the, the, the wonderful reports and research from the Ameri American Academy of Our Arts and Sciences. Our final report is coming out December 4th. December 4th? Yeah, so we'll have a big launch event for, for that report. Congratulations. Thank you. Let's amplify yes. <laughs> Everyone's invited. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you yeah, so enjoy much. Enjoy the rest of the thank summit. You. Thank you for the work yeah, that you're so doing. Thank Brilliant. You. Thank oh. you. Thank you. I enjoyed that. So in just one moment, we're going to have um, our, our final uh, guests for this segment on Pitt and public service uh, talking about the role of AI in healthcare. Um, but I'm just curious, Renee, you know, we my mind is kind of being blown again and again this morning as we're hearing people from so many different disciplines talk about how what they do is actually part of public interest technology. I'm just curious if you have any reflections um, hearing from those lawyers and legal scholars about the role of law in, in Pitt. It's critical because what we're seeing with public interest technology, what we're seeing with technology in general, is a reimagining of the law. The future of the law is not going to look like laws in the past. Uh, the law is also having some very unique challenges at the moment when we think of some of the cases we're seeing around intellectual property and generative AI or the things that we're seeing in the AI space when it comes to AI governance and getting lawyers 
involved in that conversation as well. Or when we think about algorithms and the fact that algorithms are creating a lot of challenges across sector, healthcare, we know it, uh, we've seen it in housing, digital redlining. So lawyers have a, a lot of work to do and lawyers also have a lot of upskilling to do. As uh, someone who works in the criminal justice system as a, a criminologist, some of the work that I have done is really educating the judiciary on questions around AI, on the uh, AI Bill of Rights, on the executive order, on how algorithms impact the law and critical decision making, and just having them thinking and really stretching their own imagination. Because when we think about large language models, the law didn't or had never had you know, that uh, kind of uh, challenge. But uh, technology is doing some great things. It's doing some uh, really uh, risky things. But what it's doing across the board it's forcing us to really stretch our own imaginations because what we want to design is a future that we co-produce and one, of course, that has the uh, robust and rigorous guardrails uh, to make the uh, tech work and the AI work, uh, you know, work that uh, really benefits all and work that is also equitable. Absolutely. So we're going to welcome now um, to the studio Joe Gerziwax and uh, Rhea Paul. Joe is uh, an associate dean at San Jose State University. Um, and also a health researcher, and Rhea is chief medical officer for the Santa Clara, Santa Clara Family Health Plan. Before we start, Joe, we've emailed a lot. You have an amazing last name with a number of consonants. How do I say it? <laughs> well, I was going to call you on that. Yes. Yep, I was right going to call you on that one. It's Grivach, but I respond Grivach. to just about anything. Grivach. Right? So I've got gr that. Yeah, that's me. All right. <laughs> with a GR, you know it's going to be you. That's me. So, Joe, we'll, we'll, we'll start with you. Um, I'm really curious to hear um, some of your thoughts on how AI is, um, is already transforming and changing the way that healthcare delivery happens. Um, and I've heard a lot about the, both the promises and the perils of that transformation. Um, healthcare providers are oftentimes really stretched for time. Um, they don't have time to really meet with their patients, and so there's a lot of promise for how AI could actually um, help them serve more people uh, quickly and lessen the workload, but there's a lot of ethical trade-offs and things to consider. So um, tell us a bit about how you're thinking about the, the promises and perils of AI in healthcare. I'm happy to do that, but I'm really going to refer you know, some of the more clinical questions <laughs> sure, to, sure, my, sure. to my counterpart here, because again, at the end of the day, I'm, I'm a researcher. And what I'm fundamentally concerned about in the whole AI revolution is, is really the idea that data are not data are not data, right? There are artifacts and meaning in every bit of data that we collect, including what's there and what's not there. And so therefore the artificial intelligence coding is fundamentally based on what people assign or ascribe to that bit of data. Um, so to me, that's the really vexing challenge as we think about it from a, from a public interest point of view is a piece of data may have been collected for one reason, say for example, scrubbing some data from a, from a, uh, a record that requires a mandated reporting of one type or another, right? And that's going to systematically pick up on a group of individuals for whom is completely irrelevant for regarding how it may ultimately make its way into a medical record. And that's going to be interpreted yet differently. And so to me, the fundamental question is that data are not unbiased factoids. Data are always collected for a reason. And unless we understand how or why those data were collected so that we know what data bit is there, we're really kind of feeling our way around in the dark a little bit, trying to pull it all together into a coherent answer. Right. So I know um, Renee, as a data scientist herself, is going to have a lot that she wants well, to explore with you. Well, Joe and I speak you. the same <laughs> language. speak the same Definitely. language. Definitely. That's right. Yeah. That's right. But I want to go to Dr. Paul first to talk a little bit about your work as a healthcare provider and also a leader of, um, of a healthcare organization. So yeah. what are some of the, the promises and perils you see for practitioners in their work with patients and communities? Oh, absolutely. And, uh, and I'm the chief medical officer of Santa Clara Family Health Plan, which is the biggest payer for Medi-Cal members here in Santa Clara County, 20% of the population here in this county, and also a practicing physician at Stanford University School of Medicine. So I have the perspective from both sides. Mm -hmm. And so, the promises I see is that AI promises, oh, we can actually concise all this data and 
channelize you in a very convenient way. And I'm just going to ask you to bring the mic down a little bit, oh, actually. Okay. Yeah, you okay. don't have to bring it so far up. Oh, That's okay. great. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And it can actually then uh, increase efficiency in your work. So I, I want to bucket it in three areas. One is the healthcare provider part. From the healthcare provider part, definitely AI. We are looking at it, how it can help with our charting, it can, how it can help us answer messages to our patients and so forth. And uh, on the payer side of things, which is insurance side of things, how it can increase efficiencies in AI being used in various areas like claims management and so forth. From the patient side, it is like improving quality of care, improving access. Like AI can definitely improve access through chatbots, for example. Like uh, a patient goes to a chatbot, talks about the depression, anxiety, and they get immediate uh, advice from them. So these are all the good promises that we have from AI. On the flip side, I do see, and even provide, physicians are talking about this, is that is that adding more work to us? Is this a threat to our livelihood? From the peer side, it is like, do we have enough regulatory guardrails in place? And this is our greatest discussion with all our uh, regulatory agencies, includes, including the federal government and the state government. If we really unleash AI, where are the guardrails? Because we know that there is so much information exchange being happening, and is there a possibility of any breach? From the patient side, I often see the impersonality of things and also are all patients getting access to this AI mode of treatment or intervention? Not so. So there is the equity part which is coming which into is a play. Critical aspect which is a critical mean. aspect. And that is where, and also patients are also wondering, am I getting the right information through all these chatbots? Um, uh, is my data flowing into somewhere else? So all of these, I think, are the perils that we really, really need to think about as this big disruptor, disruptor is coming into our lives. You know, everyone's talking about uh, precision healthcare. And how do we personalize? And how do we optimize? And you, you raised uh, the uh, critical question, one, around equity. When you think about public interest technology, how do you see public interest technology assisting with uh, building more equitable systems, sort of equity by design through public interest technology? Absolutely. And this is where I feel it is imperative that how AI research is happening in academic medical centers, which is very much different from what is needed probably in the community, in the public health setting to address equity. And that's where I'm so glad you have this question, Kip, that how can community providers interact with researchers in academic centers to have this kind of discussion to utilize AI in a very meaningful way to address all these public health equity issues. For example, I know in the, within our helpline we have HIV clinics, right? The need to utilize AI in HIV clinics is very different than what it has to be done, probably in a cardiology clinic, for example. And that th that is where I do feel much work needs to be done to bring everybody together so nobody is left behind in this journey in AI. But then there's a question of fear and trust and trust is so critical to our relationship with healthcare with our providers with practitioners what are you doing in that space because uh, underserved high needs minoritized communities already have very volatile relationships when it comes to healthcare being misdiagnosed underdiagnosed uh, not being heard so how are you dealing with those questions around trust and building trust into the systems that you're using mm -hmm. when it comes to technology? Uh, that is a very good question. And we went through this trust issue with COVID. When we first started doing virtual visits with patients, the patients were, oh, who is calling me? You know, do I need to talk to you? But, and that was, I feel, kind of a step up in this area of how we are doing care differently. Because for the first time, we transitioned from in-person care to virtual care. And this was a big trust issue uh, on the patient side for, at the most, because they were divulging information to, 
to uh, patient care coordinators they didn't know, they're not seeing in person. So this is a big trust issue. And now with AI, there is more. And I totally understand. And again, the trust has to be brought in various ways, not only with the patients, but also with the physicians who are providing this care. Because like I mentioned, that for physicians too, it is their livelihood at stake too. They are thinking, am I being dispensable in this whole movement? And for the patients, okay, making them understand how can they benefit from AI, like is that quicker access to care, like quicker appointments, they can get virtual visits quicker with their, with their uh, providers and so forth. So it is kind of the understanding of what they are getting out of this AI methodology and how it is going to help them. And again, change happens at the speed of trust. So trust has to be there at all levels if we need to move this forward. I can. Please, sure. please. Joe, yeah. I had a question for you, but go ahead. Yeah, I, want, I really want to respond to that because trust is such a critical element. And, and what I want to point out is in 2023, there was, a, there was a series of articles, including special issues, on how underdeveloped the scientific study of trust actually is. Mm -hmm. so, so, you know, clearly artificial intelligence and all things technological are just amping up and, 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 and hastening the need for that kind of research. But it's really important for us to remember you know, at the end of the day, almost 40% of the United States population receives care through public pay vendors, not unlike Santa Clara Valley Health Plan. Almost $1.7 trillion gets spent on that health care delivery, but yet those same systems don't have the financial wherewithal to provide the, a, a similar quality of care because simple things like prescribing or, or excuse me, um, uh, subscribing to a electronic medical record, the tools that are available for you know, you're taking notes during, during a, a clinician's visit, those aren't reimbursable in some way, shape, or forms, right? So just like most technology, Technology exaggerates inequalities before it's gonna fix it. So a fundamental point is being able to say, how do we really think about this trust thing? It's an exchange. It's something that we experience between individuals. Now, do I have a relationship with Dr. Paul? Or do I have a relationship with her in her clinic and her clinic? Do I have a relationship with her because she's affiliated with Stanford Health? Or do I have some other kind of a relationship with her? Which of those do I trust and which of those do I not trust? That's a really hairy, thorny kind of a question that is the healthcare delivery system becomes much more integrated in this digital ecosystem of what we have. It begs more and more questions about where's the point for mistrust especially in the 40% of individuals who are in the public pay system for whom the algorithms are not trained on. So at the end of the day, the trust is the linchpin, but at the same time, the scientific readiness for really being able to understand it. We haven't worked through it. We've just got over the first bump. You know, most recently I've been having lots of conversations with uh, organizations that are, are looking at ways in which we regulate AI and healthcare. Everyone is trying to deploy a framework, something that's ethical, something that's responsible. Given your background in data science and your love for data and your passion for data, what are we supposed to be thinking about across that data and AI ecosystem when we're talking governance in healthcare? Yeah. So I've got two points, and again, I'm not a data scientist, I'm a health researcher. Sure. I just know some things about data, and the critical one is one that I've already said, that is data are not data are not data. They are not unambiguous, and they are not neutral. There's always something in every, in every bit of data, whether it was intended to, or as Dr. Ferryman at, at, at Johns Hopkins says, you know, there's artifacts in those data Definitely. in some way, shape, or form. All of it has meaning. And so, and so therefore, to me, some of the fundamental guardrails is being really mindful of, okay, when we pick up a electronic medical record data set, or when we pick up something from a social services unit, um, you know, we need to be mindful of how those data got there in the first place. Mm -hmm. Was it self-selected? Was it mandated? Um, you know, are there penalties that are involved? All sorts of conditions like that that are gonna shape how and why those data are collected. 
so that that background information then comes into whatever the generative AI solution is rather than presuming it's inherently unbiased in some way, shape, or form. Yep. I would use one really simple example at the risk of getting pedantic, right? And, and that is the simple three-letter word, run. I'm gonna run to the store, I'm doing an errand. I'm gonna hit a home run, it's a score in a baseball game. I've gotta run in my stocking, it's a flaw in my clothing. I'm gonna run this program, it's a way of getting something done on a computer. Um, we use that simple three letter word in four very different ways and when you break it down and look at the cosine underneath it as you're building your data model, how is that interpreting that three letter word? when it's trying to then convert that single word into some kind of an algorithm for a large language model. Yeah. That illustrates the complexity of it, and then when you add on top of it, how do different cultural groups, different ethnic groups, people from different socioeconomic statuses use different language? It makes it all the more complex regarding how data are not data are not data. Well, thank you for that master class, <laughs> right? You are welcome. <laughs> there's, there's so many deep questions that come up when you, when, you, um, when you start to scratch the surface around data and data science. It's really not you know, just spreadsheets and, and, and building tools, but you have to ask these questions about meaning and value and, and think about why we want to have the tools. So Because data are lives and data are legacies, and exactly. that's what we need people to well know. Exactly. Absolutely, yeah. Exactly. So Dr. Paul, uh, Professor Grivach, thank you so much thank for, for being here. Uh, and we're actually going to take a short break, folks, before we start our final segment in today's Pitt UN Summit live studio on Pitt launches, the launch of a new journal, some exciting products and programs that, you can, uh, that, that we'll get to learn about in the Pitt space. Thanks for being here with us. We'll be back on in a few minutes. <laughs>